below will be starting in about one minute. Thank you, Joel, and welcome everyone to our virtual plenary conversation on disaster relief funding. I'm very excited to welcome our two guests that are here, Sheena Agarwal from Give to Asia and Kezia Fernandez from the Amazon Disaster Relief Team based in India. Thank you all very much for taking the time to be here. And let me just start off by getting you both to share a little bit about the work that you do. But before you do that, let me just give a two second context on why this panel is so important. As we all know that during disaster relief, just there is a lot of effort that happens. It is the time where we get international giving happening. We get people from all over the world participating. It is the time where everybody wants to figure out a way to help. And not all help is good. We have two experts who have actually done this work for a very long time, and they will share with us how it is most effective to participate in providing assistance during disaster relief. And what is also very fascinating is that not that during a disaster, you need different kinds of help. And these two organizations are actually taking very complementary approaches. And we're going to kind of dwell a little bit into that. Give to Asia is primarily focused on generating resources and cash and making that available to local organizations to implement. And Kaiser is mostly focused on actually getting prepared for a disaster and providing logistical support, which are both necessary. So with that, let me actually start off by having Kaiser talking a little bit about the work she does at Amazon India and just share a little bit about how she thinks about disaster relief, and then we'll come to you, Sheena. Thanks, Akhtar, and uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, it's really nice to uh, be in this forum and share our thoughts and share about our work. So let me start by talking about what Amazon does. Um, our primary objective is to really look at how we can leverage our assets and our uh, infrastructure uh, to help communities when they need it the most. And I think this stems from the fact that uh, Amazon's strengths uh, on our retail side remain, you know, uh, two-day prime deliveries or a single-day uh, delivery of items. So we said, why not uh, try to bring that expertise uh, and bring that excellence also to helping communities in the immediate aftermath of a disaster? Uh, and that's how our uh, disaster relief program came about. Uh, and three years now uh, in India, our focus really has been on how do we get uh, items to communities with a focus on speed. And one of the key goals that we look at is within 72 hours of receiving a request, uh, can we really get items across to the communities at the last mile? Uh, and we work with grassroots nonprofit organizations to achieve this. Uh, and the second important thing, Akhtar, to your earlier point on not all help is good help. Uh, really identifying how do we get the right items at the right time. So what we've seen in India is that uh, community needs on the ground are constantly evolving. Uh, communities, even uh, within a particular state, 
will still have very contextual needs, whether it's food requirements or, uh, you know, uh, requirements of items for support. So our focus has been to make sure we're getting the right information from uh, our nonprofit partners on the ground and then working backwards to make sure we're getting the right items across uh, to the communities who need it the most. So this has really been the essence of our program. And to help us move faster, we've invested in three pre-positioned hubs. So these are hubs that we have uh, across three zones in the country, covering uh, covering most of the country today, where we pre-stock non-perishable uh, items like uh, tarps and mosquito nets, things that, you know, uh, don't have any food restrictions so that we can, whenever there's a disaster, we can quickly deploy these items uh, to communities at the, at the last mile. So in a nutshell, that's really the essence of what uh, our work has been in India till date. Thank you very much. And I'm actually going to come back to you to talk a little bit more in detail, but let me turn it over to Shana, which, you know, kind of you started off after a major disaster mm -hmm. and put this program together. So there's a lot of learning that you've had. So maybe you can just share a little bit about, you know, Give to Asia and what Give to Asia does and then the disaster response. Sure. And yeah, thank you as well for having me, both Global Washington and being with this group is fantastic. Um, so Give to Asia, just in a nutshell, essentially we are a philanthropic service organization and we work with corporations, foundations, and families to help facilitate and advise on philanthropic giving from the U.S. to Asia. And we've been doing that for 20 years. Um, and you're right in that the 2004 tsunami in Asia was really the impetus for us having a, a large um, interest and in response effort when it comes to natural disasters and, and response um, and that really started our program at Give to Asia and thinking about um, what our role is in having access to the kind of funders and philanthropic capital that sits in the U.S. during a time of crisis. Um, we obviously don't have the money with us. We mobilize that with our clients and try to help them understand how their money can best be used. And so this gets really augmented during a disaster when there's a lot of pressure and urgency um, to try and serve communities. And so since the tsunami, we've responded to about 40 disasters, mobilized over $80 million in U.S. philanthropic money, and supported um, hundreds of organizations across the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and, you know, because we work with so many grantees and fantastic local charitable organizations on an ongoing basis, we have a very wide network of groups that are already positioned and already doing this work, even outside ma major disaster events. And that's really how we've built our um, partnerships, I would say, when it comes to the way we think about disaster response. Um, and I mean, when, when we try to answer the question, how I think about disaster relief, I immediately think it's extremely reactive when we know a lot of these disasters are largely predictable and cyclical, um, and they are funded too late for too short of time. Um, and one of the things that I'll talk about later is how we've set up some mechanisms and models that have helped to streamline that process, helped to pre-position um, as much as possible so that we're ready to respond and to help facilitate um, financial resources in the time of crisis when you don't have that time. So that's kind of been our ethos. And, you know, our tagline is local knowledge counts. We've always been really closely tied to the localization effort long before it was trendy. Um, and that ethos really drives the way that we partner and only work with local community-based groups um, to empower them in the work that they're doing around disasters. Um, but yeah, happy to dig in more as we get into the conversation. Because it's coming back, I mean, you know, you, during our pre-conversation, you actually shared some very interesting anecdotes in terms of, again, it's one thing to pre-position and have stuff ready, but then how do you actually make sure it gets to the right people mm -hmm. during the disaster? And how do you kind of Amazon thinks about its distribution and partner network? So do you want to just talk a little bit about how do you go from what Amazon does best to actually supporting the community for them to do what they can do best? Sure. So um, I think the first thing was uh, we really had to look at a lot of data 
And like Sheena said, most of the disasters we know, uh, at least in the Asia Pacific and uh, in the India region, we know that they are cyclical. We know that they have a certain chance of recurring, right? Uh, so we really did look at a lot of data to say, okay, here are all of our disaster hotspots. So these are going to be likely regions where we know help is going to be required to be mobilized. We, work, we worked with our logistics teams to tell us, hey, uh, where should our uh, pre-positioned hubs be? Uh, you know, if these are likely disaster hotspots, we know that maybe there's a one in three or one in four chance of uh, help being requested for in the year from this region. Uh, how do we really optimize our operations network to make sure we have our hubs positioned in, um, you know, efficient locations? So places where we can both access the goods quickly, move them quickly, but also that doesn't take too long to reach the end community. So uh, we've kind of uh, uh, boiled this down to, uh, you know, how can our hubs cover at least a 700 kilometer radius and range uh, within 12 to 18 hours. So working backwards from that and using data to start with, uh, we then started seeing, okay, uh, we know that, for example, in India, there are about 220 disaster hotspots. Uh, these are, uh, you know, um, uh, part of the government database as well of disaster prone regions. So we started looking at nonprofit organizations working at the grassroots there. Uh, and this is what we do in peacetime when there is no, when there aren't any disasters and we're not re uh, responding reactively. Uh, and again, going back to what Sheena said, uh, it's really critical for us to have our year to the ground. And the only way we can do that is by um, our nonprofit partners who are at the grassroots. So they are the ones uh, who have a good sense of what the communities need, uh, who is impacted the most, um, you know, and, and a good sense of what the needs are on the ground. And we then said, can we build mechanisms that are simple for nonprofit partners to communicate with us, tell us what they need, uh, when they need it, so, for example, today we have a very simple form uh, that whenever we know that there is a disaster that's been triggered, we send out this form to all of our nonprofit partners in that specific region and zone saying, we know that this, this is a disaster that's uh, occurring. We are monitoring the situation. Do you need help? Tell us what you need uh, by answering these five questions or these six questions, right? So it's really simple. They can fill it up in less than two, two or three minutes and send it over to us uh, via a tool as simple as WhatsApp. Uh, which is very uh, simple for organizations on the ground to use. And then once we get that information, we are sitting on this uh, from three, four, five sometimes nonprofit partners in that region uh, because we've seen, for example, monsoon flooding really uh, spread across a large area. Um, and we are then able to say, okay, um, you require this particular item uh, somebody else requires this item and we are able to then quickly optimize our logistics, plan the routes, for how we need to get things across uh, and really uh, make sure that there's also no duplication of efforts. So each nonprofit knows what the other is doing and they're all playing to their strengths. So this has really been uh, in a very simple way how we've uh, you know, managed the operations uh, or and also what goes on uh, in non-disaster times. Thank you. I mean, this is fascinating, right? I mean, in some ways we've come a long way from how we were responding to disasters in the past. But before I kind of jump in and say something, let me actually turn it back to Sheena to kind of, I mean, you, you're you doing similar things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of really building the muscle early on. Yep. So talk a little bit about that. And then I, I also want you to kind of share a little bit about how do you, how do we go from just immediately mm -hmm. to continuous mm -hmm. and how does that kind of look at right i mean how do you go from just immediate support to recovery and then resiliency yeah uh great so um i think yeah thinking about a little bit the question of what does it mean to be prepared and pre-positioned right how do you actually get that going and what is all that background work that needs to happen so that you can trigger when it's time um so one of the things that we learned after many years of uh kind of going through the standard pipeline of something happens, there's an international headline, then, you know, all of our donors are like, what are you guys doing? Who are you funding? How can we send money? And seeing how long that process took end to end um, made us realize that we had a role to play in trying to figure out how to shorten that gap. 
um, because we were really were a bridge. We had the side that has the money and we have the side that has the partners. And so how do what's our role in helping to facilitate infrastructure when it comes to mobilizing philanthropic capital during a disaster? And so a couple of years ago, um, we uh, started forming this network that's now called Disaster Link. Um, and essentially, you know, in that critical stage, we lose so much time trying to find partners, understand what's going on, um, you know, knowing who to trust, all of that. And so this, what we did with this network is when it's not a disaster and when nothing is happening that's in a pressure time, figure out who are the groups that really are trusted local organizations that are doing this work at every national disaster and are positioned well within their communities to respond. Um, and then setting them up as partners at Give to Asia um, to basically have what we call a fiscal sponsorship fund, which is a donation platform and a very streamlined mechanism that they can leverage at any time, but that we use to get funding to them. So that means we vetted them. We've done all the U.S. kind of compliance requirements, all the paperwork, you know, all that stuff that you really don't want to be burdening your partners with, especially during a crisis um, when their resources are very thin. Um, and so once we were able to uh, identify, starting with kind of the five largest or highest um, priority countries in Asia Pacific based on their climate risk and disaster risk, kind of similar to what Kezia was saying about hotspots, um, we started building out this network and um, really, you know, doubling down on this idea of trust-based giving and saying, how can we make this as easy as possible for those partners during a crisis? And so now that we've got this network ac across 20 countries, we've got partners in every country, sometimes multiple multiple ones to cover different geographies or stages of a disaster. Um, really what happens is we set up a, a campaign on our website. As soon as a donation comes in, within 24 hours, we can have that mobilized to a partner on the ground. Um, and it is very streamlined it's administratively. And I won't go into all the legal kind of requirements there, but it's like a very streamlined way to get U.S. capital to international charities um, that we've kind of used as our mechanism. Um, and I think going to your question about how to think about the phases of a disaster, one of the things, because we know, you know, relief is funded at like 98%. Um, so we actually always keep 30% of our pooled fund donations for the longer term resilience. Because really, we know that once the headline fades, the funding fades, and those partners and communities continue to deal with the repercussions of that for months and years. And they have to rebuild while they're waiting for the next disaster to come as well. Um, and so we have taken it off the burden of the donor and really said, okay, you know, it's part of our job to help to structure funding in a way that makes this a little bit more sustainable for the local partners. Um, and so we really hold that funding and then grant it out at a later stage for different types of activities that are more about rebuilding and recovery. Um, so that kind of goes to the cycle. This is a follow up, and I know you didn't want to go into the details about the no, legal no. Sure. piece, but maybe not too much detail, but I think it, for the audience, that is one of the biggest challenges. Mm. Just getting money from here to another country. <clears throat> so what were the simple things that you put in place that actually allows you to get the money out there in 24 hours? Yeah. So, um, you know, first, just to explain kind of the flow, Gift to Asia is a 501c3, right? So we are a nonprofit based in the U.S. So any donor that gives to us automatically gets a tax deduction. Um, and so they don't have to work. And that's kind of our role is that we we do all of the due diligence and risk man management for them and they get their tax deduction immediately. And either they can decide how that money is spent or they can support one of these kinds of initiatives. So on that side, they don't have to worry about granting internationally or sending funds overseas and what that trust and due diligence uh, requirement is going to need. We handle that. When it comes to this network and disaster link and the kind of financial mechanisms, essentially what it means is that we have a an organization that we've done what's called expenditure responsibility to get mm -hmm. a little bit technical, um, which is one of the mechanisms that the U.S. government has as um kind of an approach to sending funds overseas. And so we complete all of those requirements for an organization, get their fund set up internally. And then because these aren't 
like I want to distinguish between donor advised giving, which are like DAFs and donor advised funds. These are not donor advised funds. These are essentially pooled um, donation funds that any donor can give to. And it's essentially unrestricted funding to that organization. It's within the parameters of what is allowed for charitability in the US, but it is otherwise pretty much up to the grantee and the organization to request how they want those funds used. And then our job is just to say, yep, that looks like it's charitable. We've done our due diligence on that work. And any time in a disaster, we know that that work is for humanitarian purposes and we do our checks, but that's only a small piece. Um, and so we've done all the rest of it. And now we just need to say, okay, you're responding to the disaster. What are your activities? Great, let's give you the funding. And we just send that over. So that's kind of um, the way that we streamline the due diligence and the risk management um, through this fiscal sponsorship mechanism. Great, that's very, very helpful. And thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, Casey, I mean, you're identifying these organizations, you're also pre-positioning them, you're getting all the checks done. Can you talk a little bit about how, how does the thing unfold then? Disaster happens, you get, you've got supplies, somebody wants a need, what happens then? Sure. So uh, as soon as our, we get notified of a disaster, uh, we immediately, like I said earlier, reach out to nonprofits saying, is this within your vicinity? Uh, you know, are you guys monitoring this? Do you know if there's any help that's required? Uh, if they say yes and they come back to us with a list of requirements, uh, we quickly go back and look at how much of that is feasible. Um, uh, we also, uh, to ease the burden on nonprofits at the grassroots, ask them questions like, hey, uh, you know, tell us how many volunteers you have helping you, uh, you know, disperse this. Do you need help with volunteer management, for example, or coordination on the ground? So getting all of those insights to map this out and say that, you know, okay, so this nonprofit is positioned at this location A. Uh, here's the items that they need. Here's how they're going to store it till they can figure out how to get it uh, to communities on the ground, right? Uh, in parallel, we also kick off our uh, inventory dispatch processes. So uh, our logistics teams are then quickly informed that, you know, we need to have our vehicles placed at this hub that's going to move these items from point A uh, to the nonprofit location where they are to be, you know, handed over to the organization. So there are multiple of these parallel processes that kick in as soon as we say, yes, this is an organization that we want to support. We understand the need on the ground and we know that they have the ability to quickly respond. Uh, and after that, uh, once the items are handed over to the nonprofit, remember, like Sheena said, uh, we've already done due diligence on the organization. So we are confident that they can quickly deliver. Um, we then uh, allow them to decide, uh, you know, how they want to go ahead and distribute these items to communities on the ground. So in many states in India, we do not have formal disaster evacuation sites or evacuation zones. So this means organizations are really pooling together people uh, from the community to say, hey, uh, you know, there's this really remote village so many kilometers away. How can we get them help? And we saw this in the case of Sikkim this year, where uh, we saw sudden glacial floods in October. And uh, a, a number of uh, roadways and bridges were completely destroyed, but there were still stranded remote communities who needed help. So our nonprofit partners, um, and like Sheena says, I'm I'm so passionate about the fact that, you know, you really have to rely on their local expertise because mm -hmm. they know best. They reached out to the uh, Air Force, they reached out to the Army, and they managed to get helicopters to move items from, uh, uh, you know, the, the the stocking or the storage point to the communities that required it the most, right? And this is not possible if you don't equip uh, your nonprofit partners at the ground and give them the agency to decide what's best and how to go about it. This is this is the only way we've seen, uh, you know, such innovations. Uh, we've also seen in other situations where uh, usually because of floods, schools are closed. Uh, so our nonprofit partners just reach out to the school department or the education department and say, can we borrow your school buses to get these items across, uh, you know, to some of the, the more rural communities. So that's typically what happens. Uh, each nonprofit decides best how they want to go ahead and uh, do the distribution. Uh, we see our role more as uh, giving them suggestions. Um, so, for example, uh, We've had instances where nonprofits might be working in the space of education or livelihoods, but when there's a disaster, 
you know, they are the ones who have to step up and suddenly also double hat on this role. Uh, so we have uh, uh, put in mechanisms or, you know, uh, sort of nudges to ask them questions like, what's your, do you have a plan for volunteer management? Uh, for example, to distribute something like a thousand relief kits, you might need at least 20 volunteers to help you to manage that, right? Uh, also things like um, maybe you don't want to call communities to a, to a specific pickup center because most of the time we see it's women uh, with young children who have to do this job of going to the relief center, picking up these items, sometimes carrying these heavy items. So we also advise them that, you know, maybe you can just give each household a coupon uh, and ask them to come to a closer center or a closer location. Uh, so you've identified them. They know that this is an item that they need to go pick up at this date and this time. Uh, and, you know, kind of giving them a, a few of these things that which is literally like learning sharings. So we hear that somebody else is doing this and then, you know, there's nothing new that we are coming up with, but just kind of telling them that, you know, would you like to try this? Uh, so it's been coordinating uh, at this level as well that our team has been able to support. And um, that's typically what we see is within a week or two weeks after the nonprofits have received the items, uh, up to two and a half thousand families, uh, you know, can receive all of the items. So that's typically... Uh, the distribution phase that happens, uh, which is, you know, kind of controlled and phased uh, based on what the nonprofit feels is best. So, uh, again, just, you know, a, a very bird's eye view of yeah. uh, uh, what happens. Just one follow up question. I mean, you kind of mentioned volunteers. I've seen when I was at Microsoft and running all of these things, employees kind of jump in right away. They want to go where the disaster is and they want to start digging. How do you deal with that? How do you actually figure out competency and the ability for people to actually do what they're most? And I'm Sheena, I'm quite sure you have some examples and stories about this too. But Tizia, let's start with you to talk, talk about how you actually control that volunteerism aspect where you actually want the community to volunteer and professionals to volunteer versus employees who actually just want to jump in. Yeah. So uh, maybe I can talk about the employee piece because our employee volunteering program at Amazon uh, is one of our key and flagship uh, initiatives, which is where, uh, you know, we and in India, we have over 100,000 employees across um, eight, eight or 10 cities. So what that means is, yes, whenever there's a disaster, we know that employees really feel it because they've got family there. They like it's very close to home um, and they always want to know what to do and how to help. Uh, one of the things, again, uh, uh, Akhtar, we've done is, again, a slight proactive management with our employees. So when we're pre-positioning our relief items, for example, uh, we get our employees to come in and help and say, hey, uh, you know, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is how we support communities during this during disasters. This is how we are committed to supporting. Why don't you come in and help us? Because when a uh, disaster strikes, uh, these are the same items that are going to go and, you know, be used by the community. So that's one way we've been able to uh, really work with them. So we have large scale kitting events, uh, both in mm -hmm. India and globally, uh, where we use this as an opportunity to sensitize employees and help them understand really what's going on on the ground. Uh, and again, helping them understand that local nonprofits really know best but we use their intelligence and the, the data that's coming from them. So if they tell us somebody here is stranded, we then work with our grassroots nonprofit partner to say, can you go help them? Uh, you know, because you're in the vicinity. So uh, letting employees know that they are still empowered, uh, even though they may have to sit in, uh, you know, in their office base office locations, that's one. The second thing is uh, we have really great uh, and enthusiastic employee teams, right? So all it takes is one employee champion to say, uh, mobilize uh, items. So a lot of people just want to give. Uh, so we make it our responsibility to kind of say, hey, this is a checklist. These are five things that we know for sure organizations on the ground are saying they need. Can you mobilize this in the next four days? So we give them that really, um, uh, you know, start and end deadline based uh, mission to go mo mobilize items if they want to. Uh, and all the while telling them that, you know, this is adding to what Amazon is doing. So they're not uh, compelled to do anything but a lot of times they just want to donate so we kind of also make that mechanism available to them um on the slightly more deeper uh, part Akhtar, we do have teams at amazon like our corporate security team that are really trained in 
uh, uh, response and even sometimes rescue, right? Yeah. Uh, so they understand what is triage. They understand how to be useful in the midst of a disaster situation and not, you know, sort of creating more chaos. And we are looking at them to uh, sort of come and uh, deliver trainings both to employees as well as nonprofits, grassroots organizations on the ground. Um, so just really crisp workshops um, because we saw this uh, in the case of the Odisha train tragedy yeah. where it was complete chaos, um, you know, on the ground that happened. Uh, and this all happened uh, after, after dark uh, in a very rural remote region, right? So people couldn't see what was going on. People didn't know how to respond, how to identify the severity of injury. So hospitals were overwhelmed. Um, so what we realized was it's really also important to build this kind of awareness and basic skills so that uh, in, even in a rescue situation, which typically uh, the government of India handles really well, we have the National uh, Disaster Rescue Force, the NDRF, that steps in and completely cordons off the area and stuff. Uh, but in the event that you know employees have to respond or have to act, uh, in a sudden onset disaster, uh, this is something that we are working with uh, in the pipeline for for the next year to really see how we can build this skill set and build this intelligence. But this is going to be more for a select group of employees who really want to learn the skill. So, uh, kind of partitioning it based on what employees can give and what uh, you know we can help them facilitate. That's great. I am glad that you actually raised these points. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sheena, uh, any insights in terms of how you kind of manage to, yes, people, you know, you are basically asking people to provide cash, but I'm quite sure there are people who are also kind of coming to you and saying, we have all these things we want to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, well, first of all, I think, Kezia, you have a, a much tougher job than I do when it comes to that that piece of, of trying to get um employees engaged in the right way and dealing with physical things. Um, truly, Akhtar, we we redirect. We know that our strength is not doing goods and logistics, and yeah. we send people who are interested to the right people. Um, we stay in, in one lane, and I think that's also important to make sure um, we don't cross into areas that we shouldn't be in. Um, and so we actually don't deal with any in-kind or procurement or logistics in a disaster, and we do redirect. The place where we, um, just going back to the point about the way corporate employees and of these multinationals who are based in countries all over the world, who are sitting in communities and living in communities that get affected by a disaster, how they're part of the story and the effort. Um, the place that we've seen it is really, and generally we're seeing this trend that um, decisions on who to fund and how to fund in a disaster are being driven by local employees to headquarters, not the other way around, yeah. um, which we did see a shift in. And I think that's happened in the last few years where it's not, you know, a U.S. office saying, hey, India office, fund this. It's the Indian employees who are saying, we know these groups, you know, they do a ton of stuff here. They've got a good reputation. We should fund these groups. And I think that's pushing it in the right direction. Not to say there's not bias there, or maybe they don't know, you know, whether or not their um, their full programmatic scope, but the fact that they're engaging with recommending local groups and um, who their communities have trusted, I think is a really important input. Um, and uh, that's something that we've worked with. We also kind of work with their employees to see who they're thinking about and share from our perspective who we've worked with and who we think have been, you know, sort of front um, frontline workers in terms of just being the right people to be in the right communities. And we have a conversation about it. And so um, that's just a place where I think it's been great to engage more with local corporate offices of multinationals and just noticing that kind of trend. Great. No, but this is this is actually very fascinating in terms of the trends that you are seeing and how you are able to leverage those trends. Let me turn a little bit to some horror stories that you might want to share. Where do things go wrong when something like this happens? Part of it is that, you know, we are working in very quick response times. There's lots of pressure. Everybody wants to do something. There are also certain governments that want certain things done a certain way. They want things to go to them versus directly into the community. 
So how do you navigate and manage all of this? So, you know, anything that you want to be able to share, Kaiser, and then, you know, maybe we can even touch a little bit upon, you know, whether all aid is good or not. Sure. So um, I think, again, we've not had situations where, um, you know, we've had interference with our relief and it goes back to really working with communities at the grassroots um, uh, and through organizations at the grassroots. So when an organization is working at the grassroots, they typically are linked with and uh, in touch with the local disaster response uh, uh, from the government as well. Uh, they may not be able to directly work in tandem with them, but they're definitely coordinating a response and there is a certain amount of information flow at that grassroots level. So. Uh, we've not yet had a situation where there has been like, you know, any kind of interference. So our nonprofit partners are typically always empowered uh, to do things. And they also uh, benefit from the goodwill of the community. So when they are stepping up, they are also trusted, not just by us, but by, by the community themselves. So there is that amount of trust that they've built. Uh, what I will say that we keep looking out for as potential risks is uh, in helping them really plan the distribution because uh, historically in India, we have seen situations where, uh, you know, if distribution of relief items uh, and the need is so high on the ground at this time, right? Uh, and most of the communities that are impacted are also the poorest communities because yeah. of the seasonal nature, recurring nature of these disasters. So we want to make sure that even though we're enabling, uh, playing the role of an enabler, uh, the nonprofits on the ground still um, you know, have a checklist and they are able to think through some of the things that we know, like I said earlier, Akhtar, are shared learnings. So uh, we want to prevent, uh, you know, rushes and potential uh, situations that could lead to stampedes. So that's another thing that we keep letting nonprofits know, uh, you know, split your distribution. You don't have to do everything on the same day, split it across multiple days so that you're in control. You have good crowd management support. Your volunteers know how to respond and what to do. Um, so I think these are things that we proactively look out for. Um, the the most difficult, I would say, uh, thing has been uh, really helping our nonprofits where uh, access to communities is, uh, you know, a, a limitation. So for example, in Sikkim, uh, they really worked well with the Air Force and um, uh, uh, the Armed Forces, actually, to to fly items across. But we also saw in Himachal Pradesh uh, this year where a lot of roads were kind of blocked. We didn't really have access to that kind of support. So what it meant was a, a slight delays in terms of the relief reaching communities. So these are challenges that still are there, but I guess they are also because you can't really help it. If, if there are no bridges and there are no roads, um, it, it's something that everybody's trying their best to navigate. Um, so those are a couple of situations that we've seen and we look out for. Great. Um, Gina? Yeah, I mean, I think if I may say, and this isn't to disparage corporations, um, but usually our problem is with that side of the pipeline. Um, I find our local partners are usually ready to go, know exactly what's needed, are well positioned. Um, and I I don't, I can't recall kind of mishaps at the granting and, and um, programmatic level when it comes to the work that we've funded. What I find to be bottlenecks are either unrealistic expectations from funders who want certain things done a certain way um, or timeline. Give an example. Sorry? Give an example. Oh, I mean, I'm not going to give a name. No, but no, no don't, don't name. Yeah. Don't, don't name it. But just to kind of get people to get understand, sense. Look, yeah, there so are let's... certain things you should be asking for. Yeah, yeah. Let me dig in. So, for example, um, uh, saying things like um, we want to on board a group, you know, that's in the middle of this crisis um, for a big grant that they're going to need to do a proposal for and not being flexible with that decision, not listening when we're saying, you know, number one, they're in too big of a crisis mode to for us to really in good conscience request this kind of information from them. Like we also have a duty to make sure that we're not flooding them with requests that we think are unreasonable. And then also just not really listening to what the situation is on the ground um, and wanting to do things that are quite frankly, a PR headline, 
versus um, something that actually makes a difference. And what I find is a lot of the CSR teams are actually PR people. They're not practitioners. Um, and so those are the people who are making decisions because philanthropy and CSR is something that you're supposed to show from a corporate perspective that you're doing good somewhere for all of the profit that you're making. And I find that those people aren't often informed unless they have really good disaster teams. Like obviously Kezia and the Amazon team are doing things very differently. Um, but I think that's more rare than common. Um, and I don't think people are as thoughtful about what it means to have that position and leverage and have that kind of power in the dynamic and what it means for really funding things the right way. So that's where I've seen kind of more of the frustration and difficulty on our side. Sorry, I took a sip of water at okay. the wrong time. <laughs> uh, so to, you know, we, we, we've got uh, about 10 more minutes to kind of wrap this up. And I want to kind of just get you to talk about We've seen a lot of evolution in this space. Where do you think it's going to go? And I've got to kind of put in this crazy world that we are in where suddenly everything is going to be controlled by AI or technology. How are you seeing the balance between what is a humanistic, a disaster is a human disaster? That's why we are responding. And then these recent trends around how things should be managed and controlled, where are you seeing the opportunities and challenges? Sure. Um, so I think one place that's definitely, uh, I, I mean, there's no question about is that the number of disasters is just going up. Uh, you know, whether you look at this region in, in particular, uh, the way the disaster also manifolds is really different. So we are seeing so many more flooding and it could also be uh, not just clim climate related, but it could also be because of, uh, you know, local infrastructure or, uh, you know, poor, uh, uh, like in cities, we see a lot of water logging related flooding. So uh, I, I think one thing for sure is that the occurrence of this is just going to go up. But on the other side, uh, I am seeing technology and data sharing, information sharing to be a key lever to help people both understand the situation as well as identify what the right response should be. Um, so that is during a disaster, um, you know, uh, people are now able to share, for example, photographs over WhatsApp or, you know, just like put on their Facebook live feed. So we are seeing less disruptions of internet services, phone services and things like that. So information sharing isn't so much a barrier like it used to be uh, maybe five, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and what this then means is that people who want to help can do so in a more calculated, um, you know, thoughtful way. Um, I think the where, the where the space should be or where there is opportunity is for, uh, you know, people like Sheena, myself to really build the right mechanisms to help, to help people who want to give uh, both understand and decide on what the best way is. So I see information and technology uh, uh, sharing uh, to be key levers in terms of how a response is. Uh, and at some point when we have enough of data, I think this is also going to feed into how we looked at predictability models. So we know, uh, you know, hey, how much of this can we do in advance? Um, uh, for example, in Orissa, uh, we've seen that, you know, every year the state faces issues with cyclones hitting the coast. Uh, it is literally, uh, you know, sometimes one or two cyclones even hitting the yeah. coast. And the evacuation mechanisms have evolved so brilliantly in the state. Um, so, you know, whether it's just mobile phone based SMS alerts or missed calls that communities keep getting uh, that are, you know, sort of prompted by the state and the government to make sure that they are able to evacuate in time. Uh, over the last few years, we've seen zero casualties uh, because of cyclone, something unthought of or unheard yeah. of uh, yeah. even five years ago. So uh, I think... Um, not underestimating the power of technology, but also the potential of enablers like organizations like Give to Asia, who are really in a position to find the balance between what is needed on the ground and translate that to what funders and organizations need. It could even be sometimes educating them, uh, you know, really telling them that this is the reality. Take them on visits uh, to, to cyclone sites and shelters and say, you know, this is really the reality because that's how we learned. 
uh, you know, going yeah. and visiting uh, Assam uh, in the middle of a flood. So I think, um, uh, and and again, this is a, such a brilliant forum, right? Uh, because we are able to share learning, share information, uh, build awareness about how the space is evolving. So uh, again, I think technology and information are key. And then what we do with it and how we use it both in the moment as well as to feed future decisions uh, in terms of predictability, in terms of building resilience is going to be critical, uh, Akhtar. I'm not, I don't have a specific point of view oh. on AI right now. But yeah, yeah but I mean, I think that this is predictive analysis is, I mean, you know, AI is kind of translates into, you know, really taking information and doing it. I think that what you just explained is a great way in which we should actually think about how technology is already being used and will continue to be used. And I think part of it is that if you could actually use technology from a disaster perspective, ahead of time to actually save lives and mitigates the disaster rather than during the actual disaster itself is kind of an interesting way to think about it. Sheena? Yeah, I mean, disaster preparedness is where things need to go and it's what you're talking about. And, and it's something that Gift to Asia has invested a lot of money in actually, in terms of funding preparedness activities in um, climate vulnerable regions. So things like, um, we're talking about cyclones, cyclone, cyclones in the Bay of Bengal hitting the Sundarbans and the fisher communities in Bangladesh have been an ongoing issue and it's their only livelihood. They go out without any kind of tracking or ability to know when these storms are coming in and half of them lose their lives. And one of the initiatives that we funded was actually setting up a GIS system at a hub on the coast that would send and transmit weather data to these fisher fishermen in their boats because they're out for months right they're not going for the day they're this is like a full livelihood um kind of uh investment and um again decreased the amount of deaths by 70 percent just because they could tell when something was coming had that information ready and could head back to the shore before they were hit but these kinds of things for some reason are not super palatable by funders I mean, again, we are we are in a position where we're in um, we're in a bridge, right? We we kind of we know what's needed, but we need people to invest in it. And I feel like the more matchmaking we can do, the more information sharing, to Kezia's point, to really help people understand where their ROI is going to be, where one dollar is actually going to have six dollars of return. It's in preparedness. It's in yes. all of these systems, yeah. and and the data is there. The UN has said the data is there. Um, this has been tried and true, and still less than 1% of disaster funding goes to preparedness when there's a six times ROI. So I think, you know, I have hope in the way the kind of intellectual conversation is moving around trust-based giving, about decolonizing aid, about um, localized solutions. All of those are moving in the right direction. Money needs to follow. You know, I mean, it, it can't just be a narrative and a conference topic. It has to really mean a change in the way funding is being um, mobilized. And so I look forward to more, you know, information sharing and, and knowledge sharing like platforms like this. I think we need to get better at coordinating and cooperating instead of kind of being in our bubbles and doing our own work. Um, even it's, it's all good work, but, you know, we have to be sharing that with each other. And so the more we can do that, I think the more we'll move the financial needle in that direction. This is great. So, so I'm hoping that, you know, I mean, now that the two of you have met and had this conversation, that we might actually see some collaboration between Give to Asia and Amazon. Again, kind of looking at it from these two different lenses, right? One is logistics and supplies that people absolutely need. And how do you actually get them pre-positioned and ready to deploy in the most effective and efficient way? And then cash, which is always going to be needed. And how does that get deployed in the most effective way? And maybe there is a way by which the two of you can think about partnerships where you're able to you know, utilize Amazon's computational and technological wherewithal to actually help uh, give to Asia, really think about how to really also go out to its donor base and start getting them to understand where some of these things are going to happen and talk about it in the way that Sheena, you explained that, you know, we, we really need to get prepared. 
Mm-hmm. So, so I hope that this forum also lets not only the collaboration happen between the two of you, but maybe there are more collaborations that will happen for people who are listening to us and hearing what we are saying. I want to just end by kind of summarizing a few thoughts, right? So one, trust. What you both talked about is trust. That it's both cases, trust the local folks to actually do the right thing. And from a company's perspective or a nonprofit, which is creating a joint fund, it is really using their talent and their resources to mobilize and get those things ready so that it can be deployed locally. And that really requires trust. And and to reduce the friction. Both of you actually talked about reducing friction. So that's the second piece, right? How do you actually reduce friction? Third that I see is collaboration and networking. How do you get different organizations to collaborate and see their strengths and kind of give them the resources to be able to do that and bring in core competencies to the table? Fourth, I think, If technology can be used for preparedness, disaster impact is going to get mitigated and it's going to save lives. So how do we kind of deploy technology ahead of time and resources needed for that technology to be deployed ahead of time? So I think these to me are some of the learnings that I have listened to all of you, to both of you, and I'm deeply appreciated. I'm actually, you know, I've been following what Amazon has been doing over the last several years in terms of how they've been responding to the earthquakes in Turkey, the stuff in India, also what happened during COVID, and all of that has been actually quite interesting. And of course, Give to Asia, you know, you all have been around for a while now doing this work, so it's been fascinating to to see. So I want to thank both of you to taking the time, especially Sheena and, you know, we both, we are all in different time zones, which actually also shows the difficulty in doing these kinds of uh, relief efforts. But I hope that you all got the chance to enjoy and found this very informative. I want, I deeply want to thank both of you for participating and for Global Washington to take this opportunity and give us the platform to share our thoughts. Thank you both very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Akhtar. Thank you, Sheena. Thank you both. Thank you, Akhtar, Kezi, and Sheena. Next up is the plenary keynote. Please go to the agenda in Whova to select the next session.